Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emily Riley. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at Bard Graduate Center, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's program. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. While we have the privilege of convening virtually today, we also have the responsibility to acknowledge that many cities and institutions in America were founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land, Manahatta, from which we are hosting this event today. The land of the five boroughs that make up New York City are the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Matinecock, and Rockaway nations. Despite systemic erasures, these lands persist as intertribal lands under the stewardship of many nations and over 115,000 intertribal Native American, First Nations and indigenous peoples who currently call New York City home. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge those whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of their own free will and whose tremendous cultural, economic, and technological contributions continue to provide the foundation for our lives. Before we start, I'd just like to um, highlight a few housekeeping details. This webinar has closed captioning enabled. To enable that on your own screen, you can go to the bottom of the screen where there's a little icon that has CC written in it and closed caption. If you click that, live closed captioning will appear. We also invite you to submit questions throughout the program using the Q&A function. So whenever a question comes to you, you can submit it through the Q&A. We're gonna use the chat for this webinar to express appreciations and gratitude or to highlight thoughts and ideas that you wanna celebrate, but the Q&A is the best way to get your question to us. We'll have time for conversation after Dr. Makrulis's lecture. Um, and finally, our Majolica exhibition, which this uh, program is in service of, or highlighting the research that was done, um, opens on September 24th, 2021. So I hope that if you have a great time with us today that you'll consider coming back and seeing these amazing objects in person in the fall. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Patty Madrigal, who's the Potteries of Trenton Society president, and she's gonna introduce um, her society and uh, uh, the, the other speakers today. So again, thank you so much for being here, and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Patty. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Patty Modrigal, and I am president of the Potteries of Trenton Society, also known as POTS. On behalf of POTS, I would like to welcome you all to our annual meeting. I would also like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Trenton is located on part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenape people. I recognize the Lenape as the native people and original stewards of this land. The Potteries of Trenton Society is an organization dedicated to the study and appreciation of the ceramic industry in Trenton, New Jersey. By 1875, the city was called the Staffordshire of America, both for the huge quantities of ceramics produced and the ethnic origins of its workforce. At its peak, the city boasted 50 potteries manufacturing simultaneously along with a host of related support industries. Little of that remains today. No manufacturing firms remain in town and not a single beehive kiln, massive structures that once defined Trenton skyline is left standing. But the history is still here and the archaeology is still here. POTS has been working for the last 20 years to gather and preserve information about the industry. Please visit our website at www.pottoriesoftrentonsociety.org to learn more about Trenton's ceramic industry, see what we've been up to, and find information on how you can support us. We would like to thank the Bard Graduate Center for hosting this event and the New Jersey State Museum for teaming with us on another of our ceramic lectures. Thank you also to our presenter, Dr. Laura McCrulis of the Bard Graduate Center. Her lecture is made possible in part by the New Jersey State Museum Foundation, Lucille M. Paris Fund. I will now turn things over to Ellen Denker, our POTS program chair. 
Good afternoon. I'm speaking from Western North Carolina. I acknowledge with respect that the land I am on today is ancestral land of the Anaki Duwagi, more commonly known as the Cherokee. I recognize the Cherokee as the native people and original stewards of this land. I wanna echo Patty's thanks to Bard Graduate Center and the New Jersey State Museum for partnering with us to present this lecture. My name is Ellen Denker and as POTS program chair, I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Laura McCruis, research curator at Bard Graduate Center. Dr. McCruis is a material culture scholar with a specialization in 19th century decorative arts and design. She received her PhD from Bard Graduate Center in 2016 and since then has written and spoken on topics ranging from the sources of aesthetic movement taste to the influence of patrons and collectors on the decorative arts. Laura's topic today, Trenton's Majolica Mania, comes from her recent work as part of the curatorial team behind the forthcoming exhibition and publication, Majolica Mania, Transatlantic Pottery in England and the United States which as you have heard, opens this fall in, at, Bard, at the Bard Galleries. Although the exhibition and catalog cover the Majolica phenomenon worldwide, we are most interested today in the work Laura has accomplished investigating the makers of Majolica in Trenton, New Jersey. And by the way, this is all her original research. We at Potts have learned a lot from her so without further ado, I invite Laura to enlighten all of us. Thank you, Ellen, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you to Patty and the Potteries of Trenton Society for inviting me to speak. And then of course, for waiting 18 months to actually hear my lecture. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. Um, this afternoon, in addition to discussing the Trenton Pottery's contribution to the history of Majolica, I'm going to give you a bit of a preview of our upcoming Majolica Mania exhibition, which as everyone has mentioned, after two COVID related delays, will finally open to the public on September the 24th. The exhibition will then travel to the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore in February of 2022, and then subsequently to the Potteries Museum in Stoke-on-Trent during the fall. This is a project that we have been working on for what seems like forever, and one that is bringing together over 350 pieces of Majelica from museum and private collections to essentially create a new awareness and appreciation for what has been described as one of the most significant innovations in 19th century ceramics. Oh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, you can access an online version of the exhibition through the Bard Graduate Center website, where we highlight the origins of Majolica, the primary makers, design sources, um, and provide some context for its widespread, widespread popularity and use. This is an initiative that has greatly expanded in the last year in order to make our galleries uh, accessible during the pandemic. And while not a substitute for the in-person exhibition, it provides an excellent summary of what we hope will be a fully immersive experience in the gallery this fall. So I'd like to start with the basics and be clear about the material that we're talking about this afternoon. What is the ceramic ware we call Majelica? Well, very simply, Majelica is made from an earthenware body finished with colorful lead-based glazes. It was developed by Minton and Company, the most important British ceramic manufacturer of the 19th century, and was widely introduced to the public at the Great Exhibition of 1851, held in London at the Crystal Palace. 
This was the first in a series of international exhibitions or world's fairs that focused on art, culture, and industry. And the exhibitions over time grew to be very important promotional events for manufacturers. What we're, lo what we're looking at here on the right uh, is a selection of Majelica garden pots, sorry, garden pot models um, that were part of Minton's Crystal Palace display. Now, if you look closely, uh, they correspond to the artist's rendering on the left, which was published in 1852 to document some of the exhibition highlights. And Minton's Majelica, by most accounts, was considered not only a highlight, but an unqualified commercial and critical success. Interestingly, these wares were described in this text as having been made in, quote, imitation of the old Majelica. So what does this statement imply? In many ways, Majelica was part of a surge in revivals of historical techniques and styles that dominated the design and production of decorative arts during the second half of the 19th century. The principal names that Minton used to market this new ceramic ware were Majelica, Palisade, and Della, Della Robbia ware, three terms that were firmly rooted in the Renaissance, a period that was much venerated by Victorians. Palissy ware referred to the work of French Renaissance potter Bernard Palissy, who became well known for producing earthenware dishes in the form of small pools teeming with fish, frogs, lizards, snakes, and snails, similar to the example that I'm showing on the left. Majolica, on the other hand, was a variant spelling of the Italian word maiolica. The term maiolica refers to a range of pottery decorated with what a white tin glazed ground over which polychrome pigments are applied. A Renaissance period example appears on the right, and this one is made by the Patanazzi family workshop, which was located in the, Ital the Italian city of Urbino. And so from a marketing perspective, Minton's Majolica and Palissy ware were meant to entice those consumers for whom antiquarianism or simply an admiration for Renaissance objects held an appeal. Majolica's 19th century counterpart, Majolica, was also finely painted. And given this elaborate type of decoration, it was typically executed by trained artists. Here, I'm showing the Renaissance example that we just saw on the left, a design drawing in the center from the Minton archive executed by Alfred George Stevens in about 1862. And then on the right, the Minton snake-handled vase that corresponds to the drawing. So we see here the direct design transmission from Renaissance Italy to Victorian England. But let's revisit the palissy ware because in the end, the finely painted Majolica inspired examples were made in much smaller numbers than the high relief models. This 19th century vase on the right was manufactured by the Staffordshire firm of George Jones. You can see it's decorated with aquatic plants and pond life and features a snake handle. And you can also see the obvious similarities between the two objects in terms of decoration. Notably, the piece on the right was marketed by the firm at the time of its manufacture as a palisade vase. And indeed, it was in fact modeled after an actual palisade model. The illustration on the left is from a book of Renaissance period works that was published in Paris in 1862. Now, the confusing part in terms of nomenclature is that this piece and others like it, and basically everything that you will see in this lecture going forward, were all eventually described as being Majolica, not policy wear. The public, the press, and even Minton itself adopted majolica as the generic term for molded earthenware with lead-based glazes, which is the definition that we are going with for now. So you may be wondering 
How does this remotely relate to our discussion of American Majolica and Trenton Majolica in particular? Well, I would argue that in terms of design influence, you can draw a straight line from the Palissy plate on the left to the Arsenal Pottery Majolica cream jug on the right, which was made in Trenton during the 1880s. Its bark like surface and stylized foliage, foliage decoration are direct references to the naturalism of Renaissance period palissy ware. Minton had what could be considered a virtual monopoly on Majolica for, for about 10 years until about 1860 when uh, Josiah Wedgwood and Sons began making it. Shortly thereafter, given the explosive demand for Majolica that had developed, um, other Staffordshire potteries followed. And from a manufacturer's point of view, making Majolica was an obvious commercial strategy. Besides being extraordinarily popular, it was relatively inexpensive to make because it could be batch produced or mass produced in a factory setting, was typically decorated by unskilled painters and required only two kiln firings. By the mid 1870s, the British trade directories in Staffordshire documented 130 manufacturing potters listing Majelica as part of their commercial offerings. The consumer appeal was obvious. The vivid jewel-like colors and whimsical forms were exceedingly attractive to, to Victorian consumers. This at a time when, middle class, when the middle class was expanding and aspirational consumerism was on the rise. This tea set, for example, shows the brilliant pigmentation of Minton's Majolica, as well as the detailed molded shapes afforded by the material. The service, designed in about 1855, was a relatively early model for Minton, and to me, it kind of feels like it's showing off. Notice the mushroom finial on the lid of the teapot, along with, the, uh, along with its sinuous vine-like handle, and the little feet on the cream jug, and the gourd-shaped sugar bowl, and the vein texture of the, the leaves that compose the tray. I mean, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. And here I'm showing some examples of Majelica not made by Minton. These pieces were manufactured by well-capitalized Staffordshire potteries that produced high quality, well-designed wares, firms such as Josiah Wedgwood and Sons, Adams and Bromley, Joseph Holcroft, Brown Westhead Moore, and George Jones. These potteries generally tended to focus on tableware, garden pots, and garden seeds, um, rather than large scale ornamental works. Some promoted their goods at international exhibitions. Uh, some engaged artists and sculptors to inject further creativity into their Majelica designs. All of them reaped huge commercial benefits of what had become a Majelica mania. So from the widespread, excuse me, so from the introduction of modern Majelica in 1851 and the widespread adoption of its production in Staffordshire during the 1860s, we finally come to the American part of the story at the Centennial Exhibition of 1876, which was held in Philadelphia. Although imported, imported Majelica was being sold in the United States in the period immediately following the Civil War, the Centennial Exhibition is often cited as the first major exposure that Americans had to English Majolica. Almost 10 million people visited this exhibition held to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The crowd gathered for the opening festivities pictured in the image on the left, gives an idea of the widespread public enthusiasm for this event. And this is a taste of what they saw. I'm showing here the A.B. Daniel and Sons stand in the main exhibition building. Daniel was a high-end London retailer of pottery, porcelain, and glass. Acting as agent for Minton and other firms, it presented a variety of goods and a lot of majolica that quite frankly, must have dazzled the public. 
Over the course of the exhibition, Daniel and Son shipped over 225 pieces of Majelica to Philadelphia for display and potential sale. I picked out a few choice examples, such as the Stork Fountain, uh, designed by the British sculptor John Thomas. Um, the model was first made in 1860 for Prince Albert's Royal Dairy at Frogmore, and then ultimately reproduced for general public sale, as seen here. The piece on the right is a Minton Garden seat, uh, one of several that you can see lining this section of the stand's perimeter. The cistern on the left was designed by Pierre Nel Janest, uh, Minton's chief, design, uh, chief designer or modeler during uh, the mid uh, 1850s. The life-size heron uh, in the center of the stand was designed by Paul Comolera. Both were French modelers employed by Minton, brought to Staffordshire essentially to exploit the sculptural qualities of the material and thereby elevate the artistry of the firm's Majelica, a theme that we explore at length in the exhibition and in the catalog. So Majelica made its splash in the United States at the centennial. It was colorful, it was bold, but interestingly, many of these Minton Majelica models were not necessarily new and had actually been shown at previous international exhibitions or put into production years earlier. Minton and Daniel and Son knew their audience and likely assumed that in Philadelphia, they could get away with showing stock that was not particularly cutting edge. For example, you can see detailed in the caption here that these three models were designed in the late 1850s and 1860s. Keep in mind, at this point in 1876, Minton had been making Majelica for about 25 years, and it was still considered the preeminent manufacturer of the wear. What was new, however, were the American efforts to make Majelica. Um, three US potteries exhibited Majelica at the Centennial Exhibition, Jeffords Philadelphia City Pottery, the Glasgow Pottery of Trenton, and James Carr's New York City Pottery. Now, unfortunately, we know almost nothing of what the Glasgow Pottery displayed, and there is no evidence to support the fact that um, the firm made Majelica any time past the centennial. But thanks to the photo on the left, along with uh, period press accounts, we know that we know a lot about the Majelica that James Carr produced. And Carr was an English trained potter who came to the United States in 1844 and enjoyed a long and successful career in the trade. One highlight of Carr's display was the Washington Crossing the Delaware pedestal, um, which appears in the center of the photograph and shows Carr's efforts to produce something memorable and uniquely American for the event. It's worth noting that the subtitle of the Majelica Mania exhibition is Transatlantic Pottery in England and the United States. And indeed, one of the overarching goals for this exhibition was to explore the interconnected nature of the British and American Majelica trades through the migration of skilled potter potters. This influx of labor and capital from England to the United States was critical to the development of the American ceramics industry, transferring not only skills, but shop practices, glaze recipes, and designs. Many English potters settled in East Liverpool, Ohio, a town about 40 miles west of Pittsburgh, while others settled in Trenton, New Jersey, two regions that would come to dominate American ceramics production by the end of the 19th century. Indeed, both towns publicly claimed the moniker, the Staffordshire of America, an identity that held in, uh, industry stature, but also reflected the dominant culture of each. These images, Longton on the left, one of the six towns that comprised the Staffordshire Potteries District, and East Liverpool and Trenton on the right, show three industrial landscapes 
dominated by bottle kilns on each horizon. The Staffordshire, Staffordshire trained potter George Morley established a series of successful businesses in East Liverpool and nearby Wellsville, Ohio. The region possessed large quantities of clay suitable for yellowware production, coal and natural gas in close proximity that was used to fire the kilns, and access to the Ohio River as a means to transport goods to market. Morley's pioneer pottery was the largest Majelica maker in the region. And because Morley and Company consistently marked its wares and distributed the illustrated, the illustrated pattern sheet that I'm showing here on the left, we have a fairly comprehensive picture of the type of uh, Majelica that was produced by this firm. From jugs and pickle dishes to teapots and decorative fish flats. And here are some more examples of Morley's Majelica, showing the clarity and quality of his glaze colors. Trenton's development as a pottery manufacturing center began about a decade later than East Liverpool, and like most industrial hubs, was strategically located with easy access to a regional network of rail and waterway transportation in close proximity to major metropolitan markets. In this case, New York and Philadelphia. This printed letterhead for Trenton-based Willits Manufacturing Company is obviously an idealized artist rendering, but it clearly illustrates the transport options that this firm enjoyed. If you look closely, you can see that there is a train track to the left of the main building. Horse-drawn wagons are in front, loading barrels full of ceramic ware. And on the right of the image, in the distance, there is shipping access via the Delaware and Raritan Canal. So this site in Northeast Trenton was perfectly located to accommodate raw materials in and finished goods out. And here's a wonderful photograph showing the actual Willits factory with the canal in the foreground. But the main reason I'm showing this image is that one of the earliest references to Majelica in Trenton dates to November 1881, when a prominent trade publication reported that the Willits Manufacturing Company had begun making, quote, a superior line of Majelica ware not only of fine design and superior finish, but of market beauty of color. Several months later, the firm ran an advertisement from about May to December 1882 that featured a Majelica circular. Because Willits did not mark its Majelica, the brief descriptions in this ad provide the only documentation of the range of designs that the firm produced. You can see that there were lots of jugs on offer, along with bread trays, cake plates, and more potentially remarkable objects, such as the fan ice cream set. Ice cream, by the way, was a food that had become increasingly popular during the second half of the 19th century, with improvements made in ice transport, as well as types of home refrigeration known as ice caves. And so in response to the growing availability of ice cream, Specialized dishes for serving it and eating it became fashionable. So at the beginning of my research, I had convinced myself that these fan-shaped dishes were the work of Willits, based on the reference uh, in the Majelica Circular that I just showed you, and uh, collaborating published descriptions of Willits fan ice cream sets in contemporary trade journals. But the reality is that we just don't know unless the piece is marked. And remember, Willits did not mark its Majelica. Given the distinctive bird motif in the, on the serving dish, we have determined that most are likely made by the English firm of Shorter and Bolton. And why is that, you may ask? Well, Shorter and Bolton filed the design for this fan jug with the British Designs Registry in 1881. The registry, which was established as part of, as part of the Copyright Act of 1842, 
was formed to protect manufacturing designs from being copied by other firms for a period of three years. Applying some good old fashioned, good old fashioned connoisseurship, there is certainly no mistaking the similarity of the flying bird motif on the ice cream dish with the bird on the jug. And sure enough, at about the time that our ex exhibition catalog had gone to press, a fan dish appeared on the internet marked with a British registry diamond for March 17th, 1881, which corresponds to the Shorter and Bolton fan jug registration. So we can assume that if Willits were engaged in copying, the firm was A, doing it illegally, which was fairly common throughout the trade, and B, not doing it for very long, given that the partners had made the decision to discontinue their Magellica production after just over a year and focus their energies on producing whiteware and balloon. And here we have a, the same or similar flying bird motif. And these are neither made by Willits or by Shorter and Bolton, but by the short-lived Eureka Pottery in Trenton, a business that was started by Leon Weil in January or February of 1883. And we know this because Weil very helpfully marked his Majelica with his maker's mark on the back. The Eureka wares are clearly inspired by, the, by these designs executed by the English firm of Shorter and Bolton. The Trenton examples copy the bird and blossoming prunus decoration featured on the plate and comports here, and also the textured ground. But before we delve into the business of Mr. Weil and the Eureka pottery, perhaps it would be useful to reflect on why there was so much copying of this type of pattern in Trenton at this time. And the simple answer is the vagaries of popular taste. The aesthetic movement, which began in England in the 1860s and spread to the United States about a decade later, sought to promote the centrality of art in everyday life. This has been explained by design historians as a response to the excessive materialism of the modern industrial age. But at its core, the aesthetic movement principles maintained that art should not be confined to painting, sculpture, and architecture, but should also be applied to metalwork, fashion, furniture making, interior design, and of course, ceramics. In a practical sense, the aesthetic movement promoted a fresh approach to design and decoration, and the exoticism of Japanese art played a prominent role in the development of this new, new vocabulary of ornament. Butterflies, birds, fans, bamboo, blossoming prunus branches, and even basketwork were some of the Japanese ornamental motifs used most frequently in Majelica designs. This Japanese woodblock print on the left captures the essence of this approach to decoration. Yes, it's pretty, but more than that, the spare asymmetrical design elements really drove the appeal for this type of ornament. The Eureka pottery did not start out making Majelica in the aesthetic taste. My assumption based on trade reports was that the firm began with these more humble works. Leon Weil, the founder, had no pottery experience and in fact had been a wholesale liquor distributor in Philadelphia until his business failed in 1879. He inexplicably arrived in Trenton after a period of unemployment and started the business funded by his wife and mother-in-law. The first credit agency reports for Eureka noted that the business prospects appeared rather doubtful, but while managed to pull it together, albeit briefly. Three months later, the Crockery and Glass Journal described Eureka as a small but busy establishment, employing about 20 women at the time to decorate the Majelica. The output was deemed, quote, very credible for such a modest concern. And by all accounts, it was. This pair of marked vases in the Japanese taste 
decorated with the, the now familiar flying bird motif and a molded wicker basket detail at the base was available in several colorways and also a related jug shape. This Eureka plate on the left with its asymmetrical surface uh, design was derived from the Josiah Wedgwood and Sons Lincoln pattern, pattern which I'm showing on the right, uh, which was introduced in about 1881. And again, it shows the aesthetic design focus of the firm. One exceedingly popular Eureka design for collectors is this Merry Christmas plate, which uses a variation on the Japanese bird and effectively morphs the plum blossom into a holly branch. In terms of the larger cultural trends relating to Christmas, like Christmas trees, Christmas cards, and Christmas presents, the 1870s and 1880s marked the period in which it all started to become a big business in America. And Eureka certainly appears to have made a solid attempt to capitalize on the commercialism of the season. So generally speaking, the Eureka Pottery's output was well-designed and well-executed, but after only one year in business, the pottery closed in February, 1883. Not an uncommon occurrence in the trade, but perplexing because to my knowledge, while never materialized at another pottery. Which brings us to Joseph S. Mayer's Arsenal Pottery, the most prolific maker of Majelica in Trenton. Mayer was born into a family of potters and had years of training in England before emigrating to the United States and settling in Trenton by about 1870. Six years later, he established his pottery fitted with one kiln at the corner of Third and Temple Streets for the production of Rockingham and Yellowware. Rockingham is a molded earthenware typically finished in a brown glaze. And for Mayer, this served as a precursor to his later Majolica production. This price list did not make it into the exhibition catalog, hence the poor image, image quality. But I think it's really interesting to see Mayer's early commercial efforts. In addition to what you see listed here, he also made a variety of plain flower pots and utilitarian kitchenwares. And here are two marked Rockingham examples, the anchor jug on the bottom and the ubiquitous Rebecca at the well teapot. Um, these patterns and close variations were produced by dozens of different potteries. And indeed, the Rebecca teapot was generally considered one of the best selling Rockingham designs made during the period. Joseph's older brother, James, joined him in the business by 1879, which explains the Mayer brothers' reference on the printed price list. James apparently supplied a much needed infusion of capital. And, per, and perhaps a bit of institutional gravitas as he served as the treasurer of the newly formed U.S. Rockingham and Yellowware Association. James Mayer himself was an accomplished potter and chemist. A contemporary newspaper reports that in 1882, due to, it was due to his chemical knowledge of the chemistry, excuse me, it was due to his knowledge of the chemistry of color that Arsenal was able to expand from the production of Rockingham into the production of Majelica. The formulation of a successful glaze was not necessarily easy. It required the skill of a chemist and the sensibilities of an artist to correctly balance the various components in order to produce the intended, the intended finish and to produce that finish on a consistent basis. Shortly after launching Arsenal's Majelica, trade reports enthusiastically declared that, quote, the colors are much superior to the general run in this class of goods. And indeed, the Arsenal glazes at their best are brightly hued and often have a subtle up luster. Naturalistic ornament dominated Arsenal's production. Plants used for decorative effect 
as well as representation of nature through textiles, wallpaper, and ceramics became important elements of 19th century middle-class interiors. The proximity to the natural world, whether real or man-made, was thought to present the home as a healthy, nurturing environment. Such enthusiasm for house plants could have the effect of producing interiors like this one, an extreme example of bringing the outdoors in, or something more modest like this one. Domestic conservatories were uh, another popular option for indoor gardening. And here we see uh, the potted plants displayed in a conservatory just off the parlor. Ferns and palms were amongst the most favored uh, indoor plants cultivated. And beyond the edification that domestic horticulture provided, there were also thought to be significant health benefits from having plants inside the home. I don't think it's a stretch to say that Arsenal Majelica with its naturalistic design focus was in some way influenced by this widespread cultural trend. Joseph Mayer exhibited Majelica and Rockingham Ware at the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial held in New Orleans, which opened in December of 1884. Inspired by the success of the Philadelphia Centennial, this exhibition was organized to celebrate the city and to mark the 100th anniversary of the nation's first documented shipment of cotton to England. And here is a stereoscopic view of a few of the exhibitors. I want very much to believe that we are looking at ceramics of some sort in the foreground, um, but it's really hard to determine given the image quality. Nonetheless, uh, it is a great document of the internal structure of the building. The Arsenal Pottery's main showpieces for this exhibition were these two large Majolica vases. The example on the left is decorated with a trailing vine motif and what appear to be cotton bowls molded into the design. This vase actually remains within the Mare family currently, and we are really, really pleased to be able to include this important piece in our show this fall. The vessel on the right was also decorated to reflect the cotton-based theme of the exhibition um, with a painted vignette depicting paddle wheel river boats and bales of cotton framed by lush greenery, which I think we can assume to be flowering cotton plants. The other side has this mashup of, of patriotic symbolism along with a prominent maker's mark uh, incorporated into the decoration. Both vases represent the ambitious design and advanced technical capabilities of the Arsenal pottery at the time. Realizing the marketing potential of, of participating in this event, Mayer, who was known as a consummate salesman, produced a limited number of souvenir plaques for the exhibition. You can see the plaque about the size of a paperweight is identical in design to the rondel that is featured on the vase. The plaque has a freehand mark on the underside that specifically references the New Orleans exhibition. Now, you may be wondering what other Majelica was shown in New Orleans. And not, surprising, not surprisingly, there was a bit of it. The Chesapeake Pottery of Baltimore showed some examples as part of the larger Maryland State display including pieces from its Calvertine line of solid colored majolica. Another notable display of American majolica was shown by the firm of Griffin Smith and Hill, a pottery that was based about 30 miles north and west of Philadelphia in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Griffin was a prolific maker of majolica and produced many different shapes and patterns and we don't know the exact uh, pieces that were shown by this firm uh, in New Orleans, but contemporary trade journals reported that the selection was sizable with perhaps as many as 150 pieces of Majolica on display. These particular plates are from the popular shell and cauliflower lines, 
Both patterns were applied to numerous shapes from teapots and cream jugs to comports and spittoons. Griffin, Smith and Hill consistently marked its wares with the impressed monogram of the founders, along with the trade name Etruscan Majelica. Another significant aspect of this firm's business was its use of printed catalogs. This particular example was produced at the time of the New Orleans Centennial and represents the only multi-page chromolithographed Majelica catalog known to, be, known to have been issued by an American or English firm, which gives us some indication of this management's relatively sophisticated approach to marketing. Other potteries exhibiting Majelica in New Orleans including the British, included the British firms of Thomas Forrester and Wardle and Company, both of which had financial interests in expanding their export trades. And not inconsequentially, uh, the wares produced by these firms would have been in direct competition with those produced by Arsenal and Griffin Smith and Hill. Forrester was a prodigious advertiser in trade publications and generally, generally pursued the lower end of the Majelica market. The firm found huge success through a high volume, low cost production strategy. I'm showing one of uh, Forrester's many color advertisements that appeared in the Pottery Gazette on the left. Wardle in, in particular has a very appealing backstory the firm was successfully managed by Eliza Wardle, who was the widow of the original owner, James Wardle, which as you can imagine, was not a typical role for a woman, a woman at the time. Under her very able leadership, the firm grew from a small struggling business into a successful ceramic manufacturer with a significant export trade. Wardle and company focused on producing useful Majelica wares that were of decent quality and sold at competitive prices, like the teapot and the wall pockets I'm showing on the left. The hand vase on the right um, is just a crazy Victorian piece that e either one finds creepy or, or endlessly amusing. After the New Orleans exhibition and throughout the 1880s, Joseph Mayer was in the prime of his career. His business was generating a sizable income, he owned a significant amount of property, and he employed a staff of about 100 people, including 30 decorators. Mayor's Majelica was not typically marked with the name of the firm, and given the lack of uh, such a mark, more precise identification of Arsenal Majelica only became possible during the late 1990s as a result of archeological of an archeological dig conducted by none other than Hunter Research, a cultural resource management firm located in Trenton. A significant amount of ceramic waste material, broken vessels, broken plates, some glazed and some not, were uncovered that could be definitively traced to the Arsenal pottery. As you can well imagine, this was a pretty big deal for ceramic historians given that no business records survived for the firm. And many of these findings were published in the Potteries of Trenton Society newsletter during the early 2000s and are available online. In addition to the archeological archeolog evidence, in the course of our research, my colleague Earl Martin happened upon this illustrated pattern sheet showing a variety of jug designs. There was no pottery name noted but the sheet was actually discovered, and the sheet was actually discovered in Baltimore, which could have thrown us off. But if you look closely, you can see that the shapes are labeled, and those names just happen to match the shape names referenced in years' worth of trade journal descriptions that I had read about what Arsenal had produced. So with this sheet, we were able to attribute many more designs to the Arsenal pottery. Mayer made no claims as to the originality of his Majelica designs, and indeed copied freely from English and American models. While the rustic jug with its molded wild rose decoration 
the basket jug and the London jug may have been unique to the Arsenal pottery. The marine jug was a copy of a wardle model. The tea jug with its reeded ground and uh, pink ribbon detail was derived from a Wedgwood model. And the corn jug, which, is, which can be seen in the upper right hand corner, was copied from the English firm of Adams and Bromley, a pottery with an extensive US export business. Mayer, as I mentioned previously, took an active role in promoting the company, speaking frequently to the press about his views on the trade and other local interests. One statement that he shared with a writer for the Pottery and Glassware Reporter really resonated with me. When asked how he had become so successful, Mayer claimed quite simply that everybody wants a jug. And in fact, this phrase seemed to shape the production strategy of his entire business. Arsenal focused on low cost, high volume Magellica for the masses. And this approach helped to make him a very wealthy man, at least for a few years. Not surprisingly, we found an additional pattern sheet that illustrated other shapes made by the firm. The focus, as you can see here, uh, is overwhelmingly on naturalistic ornament. Um, such as the begonia leaf plate, um, the two-handled cake plate with geranium decoration, the blackberry basket plate, and the strawberry plate also with sort of a textured basket-like ground. And while much of Arsenal's Magellica featured this floral and foliate decoration and could be characterized as stylistically ambiguous. There were several patterns offered that reflected notions of the popular aesthetic movement taste. For example, the shallow mush plate, which is illustrated in the lower right hand corner, um, uh, incorporates an asymmetrical blossoming prunus branch and palm fronds creating an accessible yet sophisticated Japanese design. And this was actually inspired by the popular Wedgwood St. Louis pattern, which was registered in 1882. Another Japanese design rendered with butterflies, which appears on the pattern sheet bottom center, was also produced with a flying crane motif. And you may recall that a similar version of this particular decoration featured prominently on the uh, Magellica wall pockets and teapot that I showed that was made by Wardle. And in fact, this Arsenal bread tray on the right was copied from a registered Wardle model on the left. And we have this lovely unglazed fragment from the Trenton dig to further verify the attribution. Mayer stopped making Rockingham in the first half of 1885 <clears throat> and attempted to supplement his production with a line of the newly fashionable barbatine or raised flower ware. And here I'm showing this advertisement for the English maker Simon Fielding featuring his firm's uh, raised flower ware where, to give you an idea of the very elaborate nature of this type of um, decorated Majelica. And also because I simply have not been able to locate any Arsenal Barbatine, probably because so there wasn't that much of it made. Mayer also experimented with a line of decorative tiles. Um, these were used for fireplace hearths and mantles. And um, he did this sometime during the mid 1880s. The sunflower pattern appears on the left and an abstract rosette pattern appears on the right. And these photos were taken at Mayer's home in Fieldsboro, New Jersey, where he lived from about 1885 to 1896. 
the house is open to the public and apparently it's haunted and ghost tours appear to be the main source of revenue for the property. So that interests you. There was a, certainly by this time an acknowledgement on Mayor's part that diversification was not only necessary but essential to sustain the business. And to that end, Arsenal produced ironstone, white wares, and even briefly attempted manufacturing a line of belief china. But by the early 1890s, the pottery was in financial trouble. American tastes were changing, and although Mayer had found a lucrative market niche for his Majelica, by this time, the ware had really fallen out of fashion. The Arsenal Pottery closed in 1897, ending all Majelica production in Trenton. But before we wrap things up, I want to share this insurance map detail dating from 1890, which shows the physical features of the Arsenal site. Among other things, you can see the location of the four kilns, which are the circles in the paint shaded area, and the space surrounding, uh, the space in the adjoining structures surrounding the kilns, which appear to be, to have been used as the uh, pottery's main production facility. But it is the large structure facing Shank Street on the far right of the map labeled decorating, a building wholly dedicated to the painting of wares that I want to highlight here. Applying Majelica glazes was a relatively low skilled, low paying job that was typically done by women and girls referred to as paintresses. But as lovely as this may sound in theory, the bleak reality is that painting Majelica was deadly work given the high concentration of raw lead that was used in the glazes, generally between 40 to 60%. When absorbed through the skin or breathed in as a dust, lead accumulates in the body so that exposure over lo a long period of time can lead to chronic lead poisoning, causing paralysis, blindness, and even death. The risks of lead-based disease were certainly known at the time, although safe, safety precautions for the paintresses were not widely practiced. By the 1890s, a greater awareness of the human cost of using lead-based glazes prompted legislation to be enacted, which sought to improve the working conditions and placed limits on the amount of lead used. This photo, shows the paintresses of Griffin Smith and Hill in Phoenixville, along with two of the firm's founding partners in the middle. Notice the relatively young appearance of the vast majority of the individuals pictured here. The important working conditions in the potteries is yet another theme that we explore in our exhibition and catalog. For in addition to the toxicity of the glazes, Pottery workers were exposed to excessive smoke and dust in typically underventilated workshops. In closing, I'd like to share with you this image of a large scale ceramic sculpture that was commissioned specially for the Majelica Mania exhibition by the contemporary artist, Walter McConnell. This piece is entitled Requiem in White. McConnell has been, been producing these stupid shaped Assemblage, assemblages since 2002. And he was brought to our attention by one of the authors of our exhibition catalog that wrote the chapter on Majelica and uh, its influence on contemporary ceramics. Although McConnell's work seems to reference Majelica in its molded forms and massing, it is not composed of Majelica, but rather has been included in our exhibition as a visual commentary on the where and its producers. Specifically, this piece was conceived to commemorate those who made Majelica and whose lives were damaged or lost due, the, due to the conditions in which they worked. It deliberately has a haunting feel to it, and the figures of the pottery workers placed throughout are based on historic photographs, a detail of which appears on the right. We hope that this piece will resonate with our visitors and make a powerful statement about the inevitable trade-off 
between the production of consumer goods and the social and environmental injuries that can result. But rather than finish my lecture on this discordant note, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the people, many of whom are in the audience today, for your support, encouragement, and enthusiasm for this project. It has been a really, really long process and certainly a long year for all of us. But I am so very excited to share our beautiful Majelica exhibition with you in person this September in New York. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm going to do a virtual a virtual clap. If we were in person at this lecture, we'd all be able to give Laura a huge applause. But since that's not possible, um, we'll, we'll do the virtual version. Uh, we have a, a few questions already in the Q&A, and I'm going to give everyone a moment um, to, to put their questions in the Q&A while we transition. Um, Let's see what we have. Okay, we have a, the first question here for you, Laura. And I also, you know, Patty and Ellen, if you wanna come on screen, there may be some um, uh, Trenton specific questions that come up that, that you may, may want to weigh in on. But the first question here is from Ariana and it's what is the best place to find and purchase original Minton pieces besides England? I find it tricky to determine original versus reproduction. Any advice um, would be appreciated. Also original pieces made in the US too. Any tips, Laura, on identifying these pieces or indeed finding them? I mean, honestly, if you want, if you want to make sure that you're buying something that's, that's right and not a reproduction, I would rely on reputable dealers. Um, and there are lots of, lots of reputable dealers, he, both here in the States and in, in London. So um, that would be your first point of call. But also, you know, auction houses also are, are wonderful, uh, wonderful places to, to learn about objects and um, certainly dedicated to, to selling real things rather than reproductions. And as, Great. as far as Trent and Majelica, you can find a lot of that on eBay. I Did you spend a lot of time on eBay for this exhibition? You and Earl hunting for yes, Majelica? A, a, bit, a, bit of, a bit of time on eBay, indeed, yes. <laughs> um, great. The second question we have here, um, you note an aspirational middle-class market. Might anyone put the prices in the Willits ad into a rough idea of actual cost versus middle class family income? So this is from Carol. I think, you know, the question is in proportion to what a middle class family might be earning, could you give us an idea of the cost of Majolica maybe in, to, in today's sort of terms? I mean, it, it's hard it's hard to give exact an exact one to one, but I think what the the market that Willits was going for was a solid middle class market because Americans that could, those of say an upper class uh, family would probably opt for an English uh, piece of Majolica over a piece of American Majolica. Um, that being said, um, in terms of actual cost, um, I mean, I don't think it would be going, it'd be like buying something at Ikea, but maybe it would be like buying something at um, Bloomingdale's, for example. Great. Does that kind of do it? <laughs> Carol, if that's not sufficient, feel free to either post in the chat or follow up with a question. But um, thank you so much, Laura. Another question here is from an anonymous attendee. Was there a relationship between the aesthetics movement and the arts and crafts movement? I, I mean, I think yes and no. I mean, arts and crafts really was about the way things were made, made and the aesthetic movement really focused on what they looked like. Um, but having said that, they both were um, very much lifestyle movements. I mean, they, they impacted 
they impacted all sorts of uh, aspects of, of everyday life. So um, in that sense, yes. Great. Um, Jeffrey asks, I think I saw Ellen responding to a couple of questions um, as, as we were uh, going through the lecture, but Jeffrey says another question, did anyone in this period succeed at enforcing a design copyright? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> They tried. I mean, in England, there were um, there were court cases that you could read about where, you know, uh, Wedgwood, for example, would find that somebody was reproducing a, a design and they would take that manufacturer to court. And it, I mean, the funny thing is, is that it happened so that it was so widespread. These, these court cases were really the exceptions. So, I mean, generally speaking, it wasn't really, it, it wasn't really uh, possible to enforce, but in very egregious cases. And there was, I don't think there was much enforcement at all, if any, internationally. No, no, no. Except in the, in the case where um, one wholesale distributor in New York, um, who would go to England quite regularly was, um, was found to have taken a design from Wedgwood and he took it and brought it to a, a lower, uh, sort of a lower level pottery that um, reproduced the Wedgwood design for cheap for, his, for him to distribute it in the States. And he was, he was brought in into the lawsuit because he, it was, it was at the behest of this person in New York um, that this lower level pottery got the Wedgwood design. So it was an international scandal. <laughs> international pottery scandal. Um, can you comment on the collectability of American Majolica pottery in general? Is the market for American Majolica limited to collectors in the United States? Also, do international institutions include pieces of American Majolica within their permanent collections? There's actually very little American Majolica in US or English collections that I know of, um, which is why we, we were engaged in, in buying a lot for this exhibition. Um, I can't remember all the questions, but I, I mean, American Majolica is readily available and um, at, you know, antique shops and, and eBay. It's fun to collect. And it's, it's fun, fun to collect. And actually the more, the more of it, the better. Um, and I've, I mean, over the course of four years, I've grown to love it. So it's, you know, I can't remember what other, what the other ones were, but um, but there's less of a market for collecting American Majolica than British. Is that, would um, you say that's true or not? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, yeah. I mean, collecting is a very personal thing. And I, I, I think if you like Majolica, if you like Majolica, you, you know, you collect it all. <laughs> I mean, there are some, we did, we did come, we did, Come across some collectors that were very particular and only collected Minton and you know only collected English. But I mean, if you like Majolica, you collect it all. Yeah, I can say from from we've had Majolica gracing the shelves in our our back offices in BGC for a number of years, and I feel like we've all grown very fond, very <laughs> fond of it. It adds a certain amount of like joy to our institutional buildings that I think is is quite lovely. Um, a question here from Mary. Did any of these companies manufacture candle holders, lamps, or light fixtures? Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, the Chesapeake pottery, um, I, I only showed one slide from Chesapeake in, in, uh, in Maryland, Baltimore, sorry. <laughs> um, they, that pottery actually specialized in lamp bases. Um, so we, I, you know, we definitely know that, um, candlesticks. Yes. I know of, you know, Minton candlesticks, Wedgwood candlesticks, George Jones candlesticks. Yes, definitely. And actually they're, they're, they're wonderful because usually they're, they're sculptural in some way and, um, you know, beautiful molded forms. 
Lovely. Um, question here from Mary. If they understood lead was hazardous to work with, how did they not understand eating off lead pieces could be an issue? Actually, the lead, the lead once it's fired, uh, unless you're doing some sort of fermentation, like making pickles or kimchi or something, I mean, you're not, the, the lead was not, was not bad for, you know, to, to eat off of. Um, I mean, it was, I, I think it was fine. <laughs> it gets stabilized once it's, right, once it's fired. It, yes, exactly. Um, another very specific question from Farley here. How prolific was the production of mayor tiles? Um, and do you know of any other installations? I don't know. Uh, our, our exhibition, uh, generally speaking, does not, does not cover tiles. Um, I found it very interesting that mayor experimented with tiles and to my knowledge, it was a very short-lived um, business proposition for him. Um, there was a lot, I, I don't know specifically, but my sense is that there, was a, there were a lot of uh, tile manufacturers in Trenton at the time. So there was a lot of competition and um, I don't think he made that, that, that much, I don't think he made that, that many tiles and for very long. And I don't know of any other installation, but I would be interested if somebody does. So if anyone knows, I, I feel like we have a very specific audience today that's a very knowledgeable audience. So if you know of things like this, please post them in the chat because we're all, um, we're all continuing to learn. I have two influence questions here that I'm gonna sort of group together, even though there are, so one comment here that the pickle dish is, is somewhat reminiscent of Chinese Sankai Tang dynasty glazes, dynasty glazes. Has there been any connection or do you know of any sort of inspiration from Chinese glazes? And then the other is um, French faience. I'm gonna pronounce that badly. I hope I got it right. Mm -hmm. Was that an influence at all for English and US makers? So Chinese glazes and then French faience um, influence. I don't know a thing about Chinese glazes. Maybe Ellen could speak to that. Is that something? The French faience? No, uh, the Chinese, the Chinese glazes. Oh, they saw all this in 1876 in Philadelphia. Right. And there were, there were Chinese and Japanese um, ceramics imported to Europe from the Yes, but seeing century. it and making the glazes are two different things. I mean, I don't, I don't know. As far as science goes, uh, the French, the French influence, I'm sure, um, played a role in some cases. We know, for example, that uh, Griffin Smith and Hill actually copied some plates that were made by uh, by Choisy Lois, a French maker. So, faience, by the way, is, is the French term for majolica. Um, so there was, there was a bit of cross-cultural transmission there, but I think largely speaking, it was mostly English here in America. Great. Other New Jersey firms that produce majolica, were there any others? No. no. I mean, not to my knowledge. <laughs> I only focused. I only focused on Trenton, but I, I'm pretty, sh pretty sure that was it. Great, and I see Ellen. You've been responding so, to a couple of questions, so I'm sort of glazing over some of those. Um, is there a balance? This is from Casper. Is there a balance of information of what was produced and what is found in excavations? In other words how popular was it? In the Netherlands, we see a preference of white wares over highly decorated ones. Well, I think it's important to note that white wares were like the main, the main type of crockery that people were using at this, at this point. And what's interesting about Majolica, um, particularly with the, with the American firms, is that you don't really find, with the exception of Gri Griffin, Smith and Hill, you don't find these firms making full dinner sets. Griffin, Griffin, Smith and Hill did, but um, 
what was the fashion, and this was published over and over again in etiquette journals and, and you know, household manuals and that sort of thing, was the fashion for you know, table decoration was to include a bit of Majelica with your white ware or your white china or whatever, so that it just added a little bit of color and, and whimsy to the table. It, it needn't be like an entire service of Majelica in order for you know, that household to participate in the, in the fashion of the time. Great. How widely distributed was Majalika in the U.S. beyond the East Coast region? How oh, far did it travel? It was everywhere. everywhere. It was everywhere. And we know this, uh, well, Joseph Mayer had salesmen all over the country. Um, and certainly we have done newspaper searches uh, of the period. And Majalika was surprisingly, <laughs> in the most remote locations in the, in the Midwest, in you know frontier towns and all over California. So, I mean, part of the reason why George Morley was so successful is that he had access to the Ohio River, which meant that his Majelica could be distributed easily further West and South, um, but it was everywhere. Great. Um, benefit to lead versus tin glaze in terms of the differences between majolica and myolica, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about glaze chemistry, but the benefits of lead were many. First of all, it was very cheap. It, it, was, um, it was added to the, the glaze formulas because it could tolerate a range of temperatures. And this was key because different temperatures required different, I mean, different colors re required different temperatures. But with this additional, this, this added lead in the mix, um, it made, it made the, the firing much more straightforward and easy. Um, and also the, the lead produced this beautiful glossy surface that you didn't get with, um, with other glaze formulations. The tin glaze, from what I understand, is just the, the ability to, to make a white background so that the elaborate um, pigments be applied to, that, to the surface. But maybe Ellen could speak to that, I don't know. Lead glaze was, I think what you said, Laura, very available, uh, inexpensive, and very adaptable. And that's just what they used on these earthenwares. You couldn't use it on stoneware no, because it fires at a low temperature. And that's where the colors are, as Laura said. Yeah. Um, and yes, they knew lead was bad, but they didn't really care. The idea was to make the ware and sell it whether it hurt the workers or it had any influence on the health of the users. They knew about the dangers of lead from the 18th century, mm -hmm. mid 18th century. So it's just was manufacturing really until California got into the act of uh, requiring certain tests to be done on imported wares. Um, and that was in, not until the 1980s, I think. There was lead in everything. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of um, contemporary threads to draw out there in terms of workers' rights and um, working conditions of, of factory workers and things like that. But, um, well, it's 2.50. So we've been at this since, since uh, 1.30. And I hate to cut it off, but I think... Um, this has been such a rich uh, lecture, Laura, and this conversation. The number of questions that are still coming in indicates mm -hmm. that there's a huge amount of interest in this topic. Um, there have been a couple of questions about more programs like this. Uh, we will obviously be having a full roster of programs in conjunction with the Majolica exhibition that opens in September. 
We're not sure yet what the balance between virtual and in-person will be, but there will be a robust um, uh, array of programming for folks to engage with online um, and in person, hopefully, depending on where we, how this, this summer goes. Um, this program has been recorded and will be posted to BGC's YouTube um, channel in about a week to 10 days. Um, so if you have friends or family members or colleagues that you think would love to see this lecture, um, you'll be able to find it there to share. And if you're interested in more um, programming, BGC on our events page of our website, there's a, there's a lot, a wide range of um, uh, programs to, to get, stick your, uh, get your, sink your teeth into. Um, so please check out the events page of our website um, if you want to um, see what else we have to offer. Um, special thanks to everyone who joined us. Patty, do you wanna say any closing, closing remarks? Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Laura. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, it uh, learned so much about, you know, the specifics of Majolica Manufacturing in Trenton. Thank you for agreeing to do this um, for our annual meeting. It should have been a year ago, um, but here, here we are. Here we are. Um, here we are. <laughs> um, and then uh, thanks for Ellen for arranging it. Thank you to, um, again, the New Jersey State Museum for all of their support and what we do. And thank you to everybody who came. Um, you know, it's um, it's really heartening to see how many people are interested in these topics that we hold dear to our hearts. So um, this is very specific to Majolica. If any of you are interested in more generally in what Trenton produced, which was everything that you could make out of ceramics, um, you should check out our website, um, potteriesoftrentonsociety.org. And we have one of these annual meetings every year. This is the first one online. We've always held them in person. And we will see what happens next year. And if you want to keep in touch, um, go to our webpage, sign up for our email list, and we will email you when we have another one coming up. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.